This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. Click the link in the description below. The use of renewable energy around the world has been rising fast and can continue to grow by as much as 50% over the next five years. Low-cost solar power is predicted to really take off this decade with a 600 gigawatt jump in global capacity. That's roughly half the entire US energy capacity. But one of the things that's preventing renewables from taking over completely is the issue of storage. Because we can't always rely on the weather, we need effective ways of saving up enough energy for when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, and to provide added resilience in case of natural disasters. Batteries already exist that can help energy grids cope better during peak times. But if we want to replace fossil fuels entirely, we need to build batteries that can store enough energy to power entire cities for much longer periods. So how might we achieve this, and where do we currently stand with the technology? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. We're all familiar with batteries, from the simple double A's that make our TV remotes and flashlights work, to the lithium ion units that power our portable devices. They're a convenient form of energy storage that we use every day and perhaps even take for granted. They become an essential part of modern life and our dependence on this technology is only going to grow as we transition towards electric vehicles and continue to decarbonize our energy systems in favor of renewable alternatives. At the moment, pumped hydro is by far the most common way of storing large amounts of electricity it represents 99% of global storage capacity. But this won't work as a universal solution because hydroelectric dams can only be built in specific locations. Instead, we need storage infrastructure that can be placed anywhere and scaled according to demand. And that's where advanced large-scale battery technology comes in. Batteries can provide power almost instantly, which is why they're seen as an ideal replacement for peaker plants, which are power plants that exist primarily to operate only when there's high demand. They're mostly run in fossil fuels, like natural gas, and compared to modern battery technology, they're expensive to run and not nearly as fast to start up. But this only scratches the surface of what modern batteries can do and what we need them to do. Without batteries that can deliver grid-scale storage, we won't be able to rely on renewables alone. Fortunately, good progress is already being made. As well as being built into our phones and laptops, lithium-ion is the most popular form of battery for storing energy generated from solar and other renewables. Due to its applications being so critical and far-reaching, with everyone now owning a phone and electric vehicle investment soaring, R&D in this particular field has been going into overdrive and costs are beginning to come down. Tesla's battery day is due any day now and it's widely believed that they've broken the $100 per kilowatt hour milestone. However, lithium ion is still far from cheap when implemented at mass scale, which is what we'll need to fix our renewable problem. And that's not the only drawback. Producing the millions of cells that would be required for a grid-level storage system is an extreme task. And manufacturers are already struggling to cope with the demand for batteries from other sectors such as consumer electronics and automotive. But perhaps the most important point is that they can only be used in relatively short durations. It's not ideal when you need to have our grid-scale batteries discharge for 10 hours or more at their rated power. There have also been concerns about some of the materials used to make these batteries, namely lithium and cobalt because they'll become more scarce the more we consume them, which would push prices up further as well. But these issues haven't been putting off too many people, at least here in the US. Over the past five years or so, the vast majority of energy storage systems deployed here are using lithium ion batteries. And the developments that we're currently seeing in this space are likely to continue trending this way for a while. For example, lifespan has been another problem area for lithium ion historically, but this appears to be changing. CATL, the Chinese company that makes electric car batteries for the likes of Tesla and Volkswagen, claims to have created a power pack that could take a vehicle more than a million miles and last for 16 years. In comparison, a typical warranty in an electric car only covers about 150,000 miles or eight years. This would surely give those who have criticized lithium ion for degrading too quickly something to think about. That issue of disposal is also now being addressed by companies such as Tesla, which recycles and repurposes its batteries. Companies like American Manganese have recycling techniques that are able to recover nearly 100% of a spent battery into materials that are ready for manufacturing new batteries. And there are other firms out there with similar capabilities. But despite the advancements we're now seeing with the shortening of the list of negatives with lithium ion, that problem of duration remains quite significant. And this is an area where redox flow batteries hold a distinct advantage. So what are they? In redox flow batteries, energy is stored in solutions comprised of liquid electrolytes. These are pumped into a chamber containing a series of electrochemical cells. Inside this chamber, known as a stack, ions are exchanged through a membrane and either charged or discharged depending on the direction they're moving in. 
which generates electricity from the resulting chemical reactions. The electrolyte solutions are held within a pair of external fluid tanks, one that acts as the cathode where reduction or the gaining of electrons occurs, and the other serves as the anode where oxidation or the loss of electrons takes place. This is where the term redox comes from. Many experts see flow batteries as having several advantages over self-contained varieties such as lithium ion. For instance, need more storage capacity? Just increase the size of the storage tank and the quantity of the electrolyte. A much simpler and cost-effective solution than having to increase the number of cells in a lithium ion battery pack, which can be more costly. They can also be used for longer durations at a time, typically around 10 to 12 hours a day, with minimal degradation. They have longer lifespans than most types of lithium ion batteries, as well as a higher level of safety due to the lack of combustive materials. However, all of this does come at a price, as many of the ingredients used to make the electrolyte solutions are rare and expensive, and some of them are highly toxic. Flow batteries come in different variations as well, depending on what elements are being used in the electrolyte solution, with the most common being vanadium. This is due to the material's proven capability of delivering thousands of charge and discharge cycles, with high reliability. These batteries also use vanadium as the dissolved active material in both electrolytes, which eliminates the risk of cross-contamination that can happen in flow batteries that use two types of active species. Hybrid varieties, such as those that use a zinc-bromine combination, are another popular option. This is where one of the active materials, in this case the metal zinc, is deposited on a solid layer on the electrode. They may not be cheap, but flow batteries are seen as promising for large-scale renewable storage because they can draw in massive amounts of energy when the source is abundant, like on a sunny day, and then release it as electricity when it's needed. Capacity can remain largely unchanged even after many hundreds of cycles, and their core components can be recycled far more easily than other batteries too. The global market for flow batteries is also experiencing major growth. In 2018, it was valued at around 130 million, but it's predicted to reach over 400 million by 2026, and some estimates are even far higher. The Asia-Pacific region, in particular China, Japan, India, and Australia, is projected to dominate this new sector in coming years. These countries, especially China and Australia, are way ahead of the rest of the world when implementing new battery technologies for large-scale energy storage and generally just modernizing their power infrastructure, with several working high-power flow battery installations already in place. China's Dalian Ranga Power is one of the leading global players in flow batteries. It aims to build the world's biggest vanadium battery, which should complete this year and provide enough energy to power thousands of homes. That's 200 megawatts and 800 megawatt hours. To compare that to the world's biggest lithium ion battery, the Tesla made Hornsdale Power Reserve in Australia is only 100 megawatts and 129 megawatt hours, although storage and output is due to be expanded by 50%. Redox flow batteries were originally developed by NASA back in the 70s for its space applications. But when a number of key patents for the technology expired in 2006, this allowed private companies all over the world to start innovating their own solutions. One recent example comes from a team of scientists at the University of Southern California. They've designed a battery that utilizes iron sulfate, a waste product of the mining industry that's cheap and plentiful. This combined with anthraquinone disulfonic acid, an organic material that can already be found in some flow batteries, and is known for its stability and solubility. According to USC, if their batteries were produced at scale, they could generate electricity at half the cost of vanadium flow batteries. Apparently during testing, they also discovered that the battery was capable of charging and discharging hundreds of times with virtually no loss of power. This is just one of many potential alternatives to vanadium powered batteries currently being proposed. A new Canadian company, Zinc8, has created a zinc air battery that claims could transform the energy storage market. The hybrid flow battery can allegedly store enough energy to last several days. It doesn't suffer from degradation, it's explosion proof, and it's far less expensive than lithium ion. They work by taking electricity from the grid to break up the chemical zincate into zinc, water, and oxygen. This creates charged zinc particles capable of storing electricity for several weeks. When the time comes for it to be released, a combination of that charged zinc, oxygen, and water unleashes the stored electricity while also producing zincate which is then used to start the whole process again. Another newcomer is Form Energy, which has developed a one megawatt battery system that promises up to 150 hours of storage duration. Of course, how they managed to figure out the chemistry to achieve this remains a little bit of a mystery. All that's known right now is it's some kind of aqueous air solution that makes use of what the company says are some of the cheapest, safest, most abundant materials on the planet. 
The company has teamed up with Great River Energy, a Minnesota-based utility company that's been looking to switch off coal power to an energy mix largely made up of renewables to carry out a pilot project using Form Energy's new innovation, which is due to complete by 2023. The ability to store large amounts of energy and then release it over longer durations is becoming increasingly important as our dependency on renewables grows. But perfecting the technology that allows us to do this needs to be achieved quicker than what we've seen in the past. It's taken around 40 years for lithium ion to reach the stage we're at right now, but we don't have that kind of time to wait for grid scale storage to mature. However, this sector does appear to be making some significant strides forward, so completing the crucial next phase should be achievable in a much shorter time frame. And if you'd like to speed up your understanding of battery technologies and the chemistry that goes into it, the chemical reaction course at Brilliant can help. I took this course and learned a lot about the basics of chemical reactions and the balance of those reactions going in opposite directions. It's been helping me get a better understanding of all the underlying principles of all of this. But what if chemistry isn't your thing? Maybe you'll get a positive reaction from one of Brilliant's other choices. They have more than 60 courses, including topics in mathematics, scientific thinking, and computer science. And what makes Brilliant so brilliant is that it breaks down complex concepts into digestible bite-sized chunks. You're not learning by memorizing formulas. You're learning by doing and applying what you're learning with fun and interactive puzzles. Go to brilliant.org undecided to sign up for free. The first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium membership. Thanks to Brilliant and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now jump into the comments and let me know if you're looking forward to systems like these. And as always, a special thank you to all of my patrons and a big welcome to new Supporter Plus member, John Hardy. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I have linked to right here and be sure to subscribe if you think I've earned it. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.